Awareness of Closed Systems, which is uh, an, a slightly unusual title, but a wonderful segue because right near the end, John mentioned Minecraft, which is a large component of what Richard's going to be talking about. So yeah. uh, please welcome Richard. Hi. <laughs> so I think um, I, I kind of challenged myself to put up a talk about something that's really interesting, at least interesting to me, and I think other people as well, with the worst title I could possibly come up with. Um, who actually looked through to the abstract of the talk? Yeah. <laughs> the rest of you, this might be a bit of a surprise. Okay, so this is what the title should have been. Um, so I'm uh, uh, an enthusiast of open source and an enthusiast of Minecraft. I really enjoy playing Minecraft. Um, but it's closed source, um, but that hasn't stopped a bunch of us mucking around with it. And so that's basically what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, so uh, to get some sort of, uh, to kind of set the setting here, you know those really fun adventure games, that are like the, particularly the text-based ones, where you end up in a maze and there's exits, and they're always north, south, east, and west. Uh, and if you do the correct combination of directions, you'll eventually make your way out with almost no hints about whether you're going the correct way. That's what programming Minecraft mods is like. There, there are very few signposted directions, uh, and you're often just stumbling around in the dark. But we, you know, we get there, and, and, and it's a bit of fun along the way. So Minecraft and programming, I'll just briefly say there are actually two options we've got here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the first one and then more about the second one. So the first option we have is the Raspberry Pi. Hello. <laughs> you are not welcome. <laughs> oh my god, worst software ever. Now, how do I get back to the, is it down there? No, that's not it. Oh, I don't know where my window's gone. <laughs> let, let me know if I hit uh, the presentation. Is that it? Oh, no, that's a shell. No, that's a hangout. Oh, God. Oh, it's probably, no, it's probably already open. Oh, command tab. Yeah. There we go. Hey. So. There goes a whole minute, yay. <laughs> anyway, so the Raspberry Pi. There's actually a version of Minecraft for the Raspberry Pi, um, which you can download for free from pi.minecraft.net. It has a Python module built into it called MCPI, and you can use that to write Python, Python code which pokes at Minecraft to do some interesting things. As I say, it's free, and it runs on the Raspberry Pi, so it's a very low barrier to entry. The downside is that Minecraft Pi Edition is a really limited version of the game. Uh, it has a very limited set of blocks that you can use. There are no entities. No, there's nothing else running around. There's no mobs. There's no challenge in terms of gameplay. It's purely a creative tool. And also, the programming experience is, as I, I think, a bit suboptimal because the, the game itself runs in this kind of pseudo window on the desktop. And then you have to find some space to put an editor window next to it, and they run in separate processes. So you're jumping between the two, and you fire off your code, and then quickly jump back into Minecraft to see what's happening. And yeah, so it's not a great experience, but it is there. And it's, as I say, very low barrier to entry. And even with those limitations, it hasn't stopped a lot of people playing around with it. So you know, it's there, and it's good, and there's lots of resources to support it. So that's all good. But as I said, it's not the full Minecraft experience. Hello. So Minecraft itself is a, like, the, the basic game. Um, <coughs> somebody's phone ringing? That's, anyway. So uh, Minecraft itself, uh, beyond the, the Pi edition, has a bunch of extra stuff. Like, there's the challenge of the game, there's the mobs, there's, there's everything else in there. Can I just get an idea of who's played Minecraft? Awesome. Awesome. The rest of you, I hope this makes some sense. Um, and the nice thing about Minecraft is that you can enhance it through modifications. So this isn't what Minecraft looks like normally. This is a modified version of it with enhanced graphics. Um, some of the modifications can do things like add new mobs to the game. So this is a mod that just adds a bunch of new creatures. Um, you can change the gameplay by making it more difficult um, and providing tool, uh, new tools to the player uh, to play around with uh, in the game as well. 
Um, but look, we're all nerds here. I think we can comfortably say that. So what you really want to do is actually build like a server farm in Minecraft. <laughs> so that's what a server farm in Minecraft looks like. Um, it's comprised of processing nodes and storage nodes and, and communication buses and there's a little diagram for you. Um, and you can use it to, you can control it to do all sorts of really cool things. You can't program it as such. You can ask it to do some fairly complex things, but um, it, it's still pretty awesome. Um, yeah. So Minecraft, um, just as a bit of background, uh, is a Java program. It was released in April 2009. Um, I first played it about a year after it was released, um, and I still play it today. It's quite a number of years. Uh, it was created by, created by a guy called Notch and is owned by Mojang, so those names will come up again. Uh, the company Mojang still actively develop it today and release versions regularly with new features. So as I said, it's built in Java, which is highly portable, but also has some other benefits uh, that I'll talk about in a little bit. I'm not going to let you get you to read all of that. This is just a paragraph from the license agreement for Minecraft. The important thing is that it says, if you've bought Minecraft, then feel, feel free to modify it and distribute those modifications. Don't distribute modified versions of Minecraft. Um, Mojang don't officially support the development of mods. They just allow you to do it. They don't give you any documentation. They don't give you a source release. They don't give you an SDK. There's no API. Um, and that's the current state of Minecraft modding today. The eight year kind of history of how we got from April 2009 to today is like uh, the modding history uh, is so fascinating. There's, there's a book written about it. Um, I'm just going to mention kind of four key points in that history uh, of modding. So almost immediately after Minecraft was released in April 2009, um, people started modifying the game binary itself, mostly just to change textures or um, change the game models. One of them was just to change the font. The, uh, those modifications were distributed as actual modified versions of the game itself. And that's why there's that special clause in the license agreement saying, please don't do that thing. Mods, uh, sorry, Java applications are distributed largely as a single zip file, which is called a jar file, which has the code inside that and maybe a bunch of data files like images and sounds and so forth. And it's really easy, therefore, to just poke in there with any zip opening program to change the contents of that file. So as, a, in response to people modifying the Minecraft program itself to change, make these modifications, uh, the developer, Notch, um, started obfuscating the code that went into that zip file so nobody could read it. Obfuscation basically takes all of the meaningful names and words in the code and replaces them with non-human readable forms, nonsense. So that's kind of the starting point. Very soon after that, we started seeing custom servers appearing. These were both modified versions of Minecraft, but also from scratch versions of the server protocol written um, in, in you know, other languages. There was also uh, map and save game editors, um, and servers with custom functionality just became hugely popular because they allowed people to add new gameplay to the game without needing to modify the client. And so people could access that single server and play together and play these custom games together. In around mid-2010, there were several concerted efforts launched to de-obfuscate the Minecraft source code. Uh, the most successful of that was the Mod Coders Pack. Um, the developer of that ended up actually working for Mojang, but the, the effort continued on. By the end of 2010, folks had written quite extensive modifications, distributed as files that needed to be manually merged into the Minecraft jar file. Uh, and that hooked into the Minecraft code to extend it in weird and 
wonderful and often very incompatible ways. Modded servers became much easier to create, uh, and, the, and again, very, very popular. One of the server was, servers was called Bucket, um, and it was hugely popular, and, the, and though Bucket servers still run today, even though the Bucket project itself is in limbo due to licensing shenanigans that went on a couple of years ago. And then in late 2010, uh, a modder called Rizigami released ModLoader. And the whole purpose of that was to provide a common mechanism for mods to get loaded into the Minecraft client in an orderly fashion, rather than being manually edited into the zip file, the jar file. Around the end of 2011, Forge was released, Minecraft Forge, which brought together ModLoader and the Mod Coder Pack into one place. And that provided really the key tool uh, for making the development of Minecraft mods simpler, more straightforward, and more predictable. Uh, and that's the tool that pretty much every mod that's produced these days uses, will be built on top of the Forge framework. Um, the Minecraft modding community is huge. Uh, there's a bunch of modding tutorials out there. This is one of the few that's text-based. A lot of the mod tutorials are u on YouTube, so they're videos, um, but these, this one's text-based. Um, this one is another one that's text-based. Sadly, a lot of these tutorials are tied to specific versions of Minecraft, um, and since the internals of Minecraft change kind of on a release-by-release -release basis, uh, often dramatically, they can be out of date very quickly. Uh, this is one of the better YouTube tutorial makers, uh, Mr. Crayfish. Um, he keeps his tutorials up to date, so within months of Minecraft 1.10 being released, he had updated his basic introduction to modding Minecraft tutorials to be compatible with uh, 1.10. Another really good release uh, a resource is the official Forge documentation. Um, but I learned an awful lot by just poking around inside the Minecraft source code, um, which comes as part of that deobfuscation that the Minecraft Forge project does. Uh, and using a good Java IDE, it'd be kind of crazy to do Minecraft modding without a good Java IDE. You can do things like jump to definitions of methods and classes um, inside the, the Minecraft source code to see how they did a thing. And then it, maybe it'll make sense how you might try to do the thing. Another thing is that this is a, a snapshot of the, uh, Minec of the, yeah, the Forge uh, web forum. Um, these are all open source pro, um, Minecraft mods. So you can go to any number of these, and there'll be, a, there'll be a GitHub page behind there, and you can go and see how they do things as well. You can see that they, they all list a, a version, uh, 1710, uh, 110, 18. Those are the Minecraft versions that they are compatible with. So when you're going to do that exploration, you really have to be picky about which one you look at, depending on which version of Minecraft you're targeting. Ultimately, though, it's still Java, and so it still looks like this, a little bit incomprehensible. Um, setting it up isn't very difficult, but the complexity once you start going is, is high. Also, Minecraft, it's still that obfuscated, or well, decompiled, deobfuscated, obfuscated code. So every now and then, when you're poking around inside the Java, uh, the, the Minecraft code, you'll run into something like this, where the, the function names and the variable names have just been replaced with gibberish. And the people doing the deobfuscation effort haven't got around to you know, uh, rewriting that name. This one's a, an interesting example because I started modding Minecraft about six months ago, and I ran into this. Uh, I just updated my version of Minecraft Forge uh, a few weeks ago, and this function had been deobfuscated in, in that time. And so it now says it's called add button. So what does Minecraft look like under the hood? Uh, you got that? <laughs> um, this, is, this is kind of the, a rough block level diagram. It's, it's very, very rough, very, very high level. 
Um, and I guess one of the biggest problems with modding Minecraft is that almost all of the documentation of its internals has been generated by modders. As I said, Mojang does not support modding. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's also often incomplete and out of date. For example, the storing of state for blocks and entities in the game, entities are things that can move around in the game, um, that the way that state is stored for those things has changed several times over the lifespan, lifespan of, of Minecraft. Uh, there's been numerous, document, uh, num numerous versions of just the way that entity state has been stored and transmitted between clients and servers, and nobody has good documentation on the current method. It just doesn't exist. And that was implemented, I think, in 1.9, one, 1 so that's two releases ago. Uh, if you like Minecraft diagrams, here's one that gives the entity class hierarchy. Um, that's way too small to see. Uh, I like this one. This is um, a typical Minecraft day. Uh, and the reason I like this is because uh, if you overlay uh, the typical three-act structure that makes a good story, it maps almost perfectly to what happens in one day of Minecraft. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's got a really nice hook, as anybody who's played it knows. I like this one. This is a creeper trap. Um, creeper walks over the trap door, gets drowned by the water that's automatically brought in with the redstone wiring. Redstone's cool. This one's a compact mono-stable circuit. <laughs> um, once you get seriously into building things into Minecraft and want to automate some things, you end up doing things like this to you know, activate various parts of your map. But anyway. So, I, so J I'm not a big fan of Java. I mean, I know how to do it, right? Uh, and, it's, and it can be enjoyable sometimes, but I'm a Python developer. I like Python. Um, I'm a professional software developer, and I find Minecraft coding, Minecraft mod coding, to be quite challenging sometimes, mostly due to the lack of documentation. But sometimes there are some pretty advanced Java features that are used in this code. So what I really want is something like this in Minecraft so that I can type in some Python code and hit go and have it make me a house. Um, that, that code there, because I can't quite see it on my screen here, that code there makes a tower with a couple of floors in it. OK, so let's have a demo. Sorry, I just need my notes. So this is a demo that I recorded so that I didn't have to you know, appease the demo gods, um, of me using the mod that I've created. Um, so I guess a couple of things that I wanted to mention here is that it was important to me that the mod that I created follow the, uh, the kind of the standard Minecraft metaphors. So things are constructed out of other things. And thi I, I wanted to use all all of the resources that I use to build the things <laughs> that, I, that I create, I wanted to be made of standard Minecraft resources. So I've made a wand, um, and the wand lets me invoke code. Um, you can write code into a standard Minecraft writable book, but those things are horrendous to use. Like, they're really small, and you can only delete. You, there's no cursor control. There's a bunch of limitations. So I made my own version of a book which has a larger editing area, and it has some basic Python syntax checking and, and so forth. I've created a block, which is something that you can place in the world, and you can attach code to it, and the code gets run in the world. Uh, this one is going to be a Python hand, which is an entity that you can attach code to, and it can move around in the world. <laughs> um, so there's my wand. So what I'm going to do now is place that block down into the world uh, and give it some code um, to do something interesting. Um, if there's a function defined at the top level of the code called run, then uh, when that's attached to the block or, or the hand uh, and the player right clicks to you know, use the block or use the hand, um, then uh, it'll run that function. So here it's just a saying a chat message to the person who ran that code to say hello world. And you can see when you, do the, when you, when you attach the code to the block, uh, it does compile the code and uh, if it, if it compile successfully, you get a nice little sparkle effect saying, yep, that worked. That's all good. 
So here I'm just changing the code again. Hello, cow. Uh, and off goes a firework. So that's some, that's some pretty basic um, functionality. I also wanted to be able to have my blocks interact with other things in the world as well. So uh, if I can uh, have it re respond to redstone power. So here I'm just setting up a very basic, oops, it's a very basic redstone circuit. So when the button is pressed, the redstone power will activate, uh, and then I can change the function that I've written so that it responds to the power on event. And there's a bunch of other events, power off. There's also a tick event if you'd like to have something that happens every, every Minecraft tick, which is about 20 times a second. Uh, there's also an event for, is a player walking across the top of the block? Um, here I'm going to do something with the hand. Um, I wasted a bit of time trying to figure out where to do it. Sorry about that. So I place the hand down. One of the other features I've got is that I can copy and paste code from outside of Minecraft into the game. So that's just copied and pasted straight into the editor from outside. Um, I can also set a title on the book, um, which then comes up in the inventory, which is con you know, convenient for locating the right thing. The cow is in the way. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was a grass seed. The cow's OK. Look. <laughs> so I can then, uh, hello, cow. Yeah. You just stay there. So um, I can then pick up that hand. It's still got the code attached to it. I can put it down somewhere else, and I can right-click it and make myself a second house. Uh, and it's a very basic house, obviously. Um, you can get more complex if you like. So um, I've forgotten what I do next. What am I going to do next? Oh, I think I'm going to, oh, yeah, now I'm going to spawn something. That's right. So I'm changing this, the power on uh, handler to spawn a pig, because I, 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 I need a pigu uh, to, to, for the next bit of the demo. I need a pigu. So there's a pig. All right. Hello, pig. Bye, pig. Uh, so what I'll do now is I'll write some code that'll be, uh, that I'll be able to invoke with my Python wand. So the idea with the wand is that it will invoke code. So you, you hold the, the code book in your offhand, and then when you wave the wand, it'll run the code that's in the book. Uh, and if there's a function that's called invoke, then whatever, is, you, whatever you're pointing at uh, will be passed as a target. So it can be a block or an entity or a whatever. Uh, it could be a cow. Um, <laughs> and the cow is on fire. Um, yeah. Um, it, so there's one of the things that I've, I've noticed after doing, oh, where's the pigu? There's the pigu. Hello, pigu. Oh, it's. <laughs> And the pigu is like, what? <laughs> um, and and the, the ignite won't work on uh, blocks. So the flower is actually a block. Yeah, and it won't work on the code block either. Um, there's, a, there's a whole heap more stuff that I want to do. It's like I'm just scratching itches at the moment. And there's so much more that I can do for this thing. I wanted to show you, though, this is a, this is a bit of fun. Uh, this was while I was developing it. And I was, trying to, I was learning how to do doors. Uh, because doors are actually a little bit more tricky than you imagine. Because if you get it wrong, <laughs> you get, um, yeah, that's two door bottoms, um, <laughs> where there should be just one solid door. So that, yeah, um, oops. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, yeah, sometimes it goes wrong in odd ways. So my dream again, take what is a very, very complex thing, which is modding Minecraft, and make it more accessible. I've got a friend whose son would like to make a grapple gun. And that is what I'm hoping will be so much simpler by being able to say, invoke the wand, find out what it's pointing at, and teleport the player to that block. You know, that's, that's a basic grapple gun. We could make it more fancy than that, but that's the basic idea. So that whole thing, by the way, of invoke find out the target, and if it's an entity, then set it on fire. OK, so for example, igniting pigus. All right, so <laughs> this is the right-click event handler. I just want to explain how horribly complex this gets under the hood. I couldn't get this to work, this, this right-click handler. Um, pigus would ignite, but then they'd go out immediately, which is not fun. Um, I ended up po posting a message on one of the community forums, which are amazing resources. Um, 
And my, I was answered very quickly, and somebody said, well, duh, you're trying to run that on the, on the server. Uh, you need to run on the client because the thing doesn't exist. Like the, on, uh, the object mouse over doesn't exist on the server, but you need to get that from the client to the server, otherwise the client's state will be reset the next time the server sends an update message to the client, and the pigu won't be on fire anymore. So I had to do networking. This is crazy pants. So. Um, I had to set up a channel inside my mod so that my mod could do networking. I had to write a message to encapsulate the information about the wand has been invoked so I could send it from the client to the server. <sighs> then there's a handler on the server to actually do the invoking thing, uh, whatever that might be. In this case, I'm just finding the invoke method inside my Python code and I'm going to run that thing. Or, you know, this is. This is the point of all of this. So I think this is, I enjoy doing this. So, um, and I'm hoping to add more, and it's good fun. It's also an open source project, like all of those other ones I showed you on the forum. There are, there's like three or 400 that came up on a simple search. So there's a lot going on out there. If you like the idea of this, I would welcome you to uh, come along and help me out, because I find it fun, and you might find it fun too. So that's where you can find the project. And there's information there about how to get it going in development and just as a player. Uh, and there's a lot of documentation there about how it all works and the sort of things you can do in the mod as well. Um, thank you very much. I think I've gone over time. <laughs> um, so up now we have our play session. And that's going to take a little bit of time to get set up. I